everybody. My name is Amanda Gobley and I'm with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And today I'm here with Dr. Dale Rollins, who's going to be telling us a little bit about CRP. So Dr. Rollins, what is CRP and is it a good or bad thing for our quail populations? Amanda, CRP is short for Conservation Reserve Program, which was a farm bill program introduced in about 1986. Extremely popular here in Texas, about 4 million acres of CRP. Uh, nearly all of which is in the rolling plains and in the high plains of Texas. Uh, it, it's been really good for some species like pheasants up in the high plains. Uh, less realized potential for Bob Watts. It could have been better uh, for the rolling plains and we'll talk about some of the things that we've done. But the reason that it could have been better was the, first of all the grass mixture. You had options for putting in either introduced grasses or, or, or uh, native grasses, side oaks, grama, that kind of thing. Most, uh, many of the properties at least went into some kind of exotic mix, whether that be weeping love grass, old world blue stems, Bermuda grass, in our case, Klein grass. Uh, Klein grass, I'm, I'm glad that the previous owner chose Klein grass because I think it's a fairly quail friendly grass relative to most of the other exotics. So it's worked out pretty well from, from that standpoint. Excellent. Okay, well, why don't you tell me a little bit about what techniques you've used for management and what your approach has been to CRP here on the Quail Research Ranch. Okay, there's really a couple of shortcomings that the CRP had. One is if it's a monoculture, obviously we've talked about the evils of that, and uh, but ours has some species diversity, but you got to have some woody cover. And ideally you want to have woody cover, what we call a quail house, about every softball throw apart. Now after you've disturbed the soil out here, again this was done in 1986, those mesquites you see in the background are 25 to 30 years old. So our woody plant regrowth comes back excruciatingly slow if you're wanting it to grow back. And so we've been very uh, careful and very deliberate about where we want mesquite to come back. You got to have a vision of what you want that to look like. And I do the, I do the sculpting on this pasture because I know what I want it to look like another 10 years from now. I want it to be little mots of mesquite every softball throw apart. So I can come through here typically in July on my four wheeler with my brush buster uh, herbicide spray and I can come through here and I'll pull up to a mesquite and I'll say live or die. And if I feel like I need it 10 years from now, it gets spared. If not, I spray it with the herbicide, it's out of there. So we sculpt it with individual plant treatments, IPT. Another thing that we do to the mesquites on some of them is that we half cut them. And there's a webisode on how to half cut mesquite and what the form and function for that is. But we want to make that multi-stem mesquite, cut it in, in half like a broken spokes of a wheel and bend it down. Doesn't kill the mesquite, makes it grow more like a lope bush would, which is a more desirable shrub for a quail than, than what uh, typical mesquite regrowth is. So those two things are two of the things that we've done. Over the last, about three years ago, we we did not re-enroll our CRP in, in, the, in the program. Our board of directors thought that the ability to show how you could maximize its potential for quail was more important than the, than the annual rental payment we were getting for it. So we took it out, we did not re-enroll it. So what I'm gonna tell you is on former CRP. And depending on your, your county FSA office, you may get in trouble if you have this kind of brush, maybe you don't but uh, they have the potential of telling you you got too much brush, it's got to be kept in farmable condition with conventional equipment, tandem disc. We're beyond that and we don't want to be able to come back and plant wheat. We want to keep it like it is for good quail. So we've, in these fields, in the rolling plains, again rolling means undulating and nearly all these CRP fields are terraced. So you've got this structure where you're in a terrace situation irregularly shaped going through the field on the contour and then another terrace. And we've tried to maximize diversity of our landscape by taking it on a terrace by terrace basis. Over here behind you, we've disked this one uh, in early uh, February, so we've got sunflowers coming on. Right here behind me is a check. We haven't done anything this, so it's, it's there for nesting cover. And then uh, right on down the way, there are little ways, is where we've disked it up and planted milo. Now, we're not going to make any milo because it's been too hot and dry, but we want that variety of different conditions. And then we're also thinking about this with prescribed burning in mind, so we can burn this terrace right here with the south wind, and we're running it into a disc strip right over there. 
So we're trying to get an integrated landscape to where we can use fire, planting as, uh, as necessary, and make that the best matrix of habitat types for quail that we can. So it sounds like a lot of your management decisions have been firmly based in the concepts of plant succession, which of course is a really important idea for quail. Um, the idea being that when we disturb an area, we see a series of different species that colonize that area over time. So it sounds like you've got these areas that have been recently disturbed and we have our forbs and our low successional species taking that area over. And then we have other regions that you've kind of left alone and allowed some bunch grasses and some late successional species. That's absolutely right because we want some nesting cover, which will basically be in our undisturbed strips. We want some early successional plants, the sunflowers, that type of thing for good food production, good insect availability. And so, yeah, we're using plant succession, that orderly, predictable process of change, to our advantage. And then we're also using the concept of usable space. If we had done nothing to this, the outer 100 yards of this field where there's brush next to it would have been used by quail. But that's, we're not content with that. We want the full 80 acres to be useful for quail. That's why we're letting the brush grow up in certain spots strategically to where, again, 10 years from now, those quail will feel just as comfortable out there as they do flying back across the brush. You know you've reached that point when you get out of here in the middle and you flush a cubby of quail, and rather than flying to the edge, they fly somewhere else in the interior of the, of the pasture. So at that point, you said, well, I've satisfied their security threshold. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it sounds like this has been a lot of work. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've learned as far as how quail are using your CRP area? I think? Well, initially we were curious about how well do they use it for nesting and for brooding habitat. So back in 2012, we published a paper. At the time, we had had about a hundred and something nests across the ranch. The CRP acreage accounts for about 12% of our landscape. 13% of our nests were in CRP. That tells us they never, they neither avoided nor preferred it. It was used uh, in relation to its availability. But what we also found was that once those chicks hatched, they didn't stay out in the CRP. They were making it, mom and dad were carrying them back over to the rangeland again, better plant diversity, better insect availability. So again, we're hoping that over time, we'll be able to, again, make this better, more attractive to them for brooding habitat. And we'll do that with these sunflowers and some of those kind of things that offer really good brooding habitat. Okay, well, if you could give any advice or any heads up as to any issues, if you were talking to a landowner who is interested in getting involved in CRP, what exactly would you say to them? Well, first of all, if they, if they intend to stay in the CRP, and there's always jeopardy that that'll be, you know, reduced in enrollment or whatever. So that they could be cut out really at any particular time. But if they intend to stay in the CRP for that CRP rental, then again, they got to run everything by their local FSA office to make sure it's copacetic with them. And what you're doing, what we're doing probably wouldn't be because of the structure of the brush. But uh, you may have to uh, compromise and, and make it work from that standpoint. You should be able to keep brush on some of it, but maybe not across the whole place like we have. You can probably disturb part of it in what they call mid-contract management, but you may be limited to 5% of it where we're not limited. So play by the rules if you're going to take their check for being part of the program. Okay, fair enough. All right, Dr. Rollins, so you had said something about half-cutting mesquite as a way to make sort of an artificial quail house, and now we're looking at an example of that. Is that correct? That's correct, Amanda. Half-cutting mesquite is a poor excuse for a lope bush or a plum thicket, but here in these CRP sites, really all you've got to work with is regrowth mesquite. It takes 30 years for you to begin to see some of those other plants coming back. So we're trying to make the best out of a bad situation. So we take a multi-stem, smooth bark mesquite. This one was probably done three years ago, been, I guess, three or four years ago. You come through with the limb saw, you cut halfway through while you're pushing that limb down. You're not gonna kill that, shouldn't, you shouldn't kill that limb. We don't wanna kill it. We're just trying to make it grow down and make this more attractive to quail where they're gonna spend the bigger part of the day. And we don't wanna just do one of these because we don't wanna do anything that might focus a hawk's ability to predict where quail are at. So we want to do one of these, maybe again, every softball throw apart, or maybe 10 of them over the size of a basketball court to where we keep those predators guessing about where those quail might be. Okay. And we have a webisode available on how to half cut mosquitoes. 
All right, Dr. Rollins, so this is the terrace where we have a great example of low successional plant species. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the kind of plants that we're seeing out here and how you achieved this? Okay, what we did was uh, about the first of March, we, we plowed this with the tandem disc, soil disturbance. And so by doing that, we set back plant succession to an earlier successional species. Two primarily ones here being the sunflower and the western ragweed, which are both key seed producers for Bob Whites. The ragweed, the, I'm sorry, the sunflower is kind of stunted. Again, we've been very dry this spring, but had we had normal rainfall, those sunflowers would have been up like this. Excellent brooding habitat. So again, we're trying to get better brood use of these CRP fields and by manipulating our low successional species to do that. And so are you going to continue to disturb this area on a regular basis to maintain this successional stage? And how, how often would you do it to? We will, uh, yeah, we'll just continue to, to disc this one probably every other year. And then uh, on down in another terrace, maybe do it at a different time of the year. We'll have some burns that are done in February. We'll have some burns that are done in September. So again, by manipulating, oftentimes if we manipulate the date of that disturbance, it doesn't have to be a great difference. We can see some tremendously different plant responses. And so we're still in a learning mode from that standpoint, but we know that that February, March time frame is good for growing sunflowers and, uh, and we'll get the Western ragweeds too. So that's a great one-two punch for us.